Welcome, welcome, welcome to another opportunity to learn and grow. And the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. This is class time. We have information technology with I and I, Leo Lewis. Today we'll be looking at computer hardware, specifically storage media and devices. Make way forward. All right, so we're talking about storage media. It's one of possibly the most overlooked topics, I believe, in the syllabus, but it's pretty integral. And there are two specific areas inside of the syllabus we'd like to pay attention to. Specifically, the section that says we need to explain, explain what these devices are, explain how to use them. Now, fact is, there are two types of storage, kind of. The idea behind them is that there's one set that stores information temporarily, and that means as long as there is power on the device, then of course, the memory will always store information. The other is permanent, meaning that regardless of whether or not there is power, there will always be information stored on that piece of device or that media. And so we try to classify storage into these basic categories. When we talk about temporary, however, we don't really use the word storage. We use the word memory. And when we talk about memory, the first thing that always jumps to mind for most students is RAM, random access memory. And random access memory stores information just slightly or keeps it so that your CPU can grab it pretty quickly as opposed to going straight to your hard disk. Now it's called random because the fact of the matter is you can go to any position in the memory based on how your operating system has managed the memory itself. So we have random access memory, we have registers, and these are what we call the CPU workhorses. Why they are CPU workhorses? Essentially because they are found directly on the CPU. So even though you might buy a chip, or you might see your computer come with a CPU and you think that that's just the processor. Actually, there are other things inside your CPU, the register including. And then we have cache. And if you were here last week, we looked at three levels of cache. So we're going to look at it a little bit closer today. And then we have RAM. Now, there's a question mark beside RAM. And we'll discuss why we have a question mark beside RAM. Because remember, when we talk about memory, it's supposed to be temporary. And that's what we, of course, have designed it for. So, RAM. Very early forms of RAM came in the form of capacitors. And these capacitors, and those of you who do physics and are at fifth form might be thinking, okay, capacitors, I do know about capacitors. They store charge. Exactly. And that is what this type of RAM used to do. And we call it static RAM. Because as long as you stored something there, it just stayed there. But then... The developments changed, and we started to use something called dynamic RAM, which, of course, is about circuitry now. And this dynamic RAM has to be refreshed on a regular basis by your computer or by the power that's coming into your computer. Now, for those of you who are doing Cape Comsai, if you're watching uh, at the uh, unit one, I think it is, you have to learn about flip-flops. And these flip-flops are the memory agents. These are the smaller devices that store a bit. All right? And then we have SDRAM. And the S stands for synchronous, meaning that this RAM chip is now refreshed based on the clock that is inside the CPU. So there's a time on the refreshing. There's a time on how the, the computer makes sure that the information is there repeatedly. So it's not about just keeping one static charge and holding it. It's about refreshing the information. Because the truth of the matter is your computer goes at a very fast pace and is always switching information in and out of memory locations. And so we, we really need to keep that refreshing going on. And then even last week we looked at DDR, which is double data rate. And we, we, we said that there are about four or five levels depending on what, um, what machine you're working with. And this DDR is about double data rate, increasing the rate at which um, information is written to RAM or taken from RAM. And of course, we go on to RAM. And one of the reasons why there was a question mark beside RAM is because RAM isn't really temporary, but we tend to include it in memory. And we, we think about it that way because it's very primary. 
In other words, it has to exist in your machine for your machine to work. Why? Well, it stores the startup instructions for your computer. So let's say you turn your computer on, you know, the power comes up, you hear some noise going on. Your ROM stores some subroutines that might tell the computer, okay, check see if memory is there, check see if a hard drive is there, check, check to see if a mouse is connected, things like that. And what is happening here is that your subroutines inside of ROM are running to ensure that your computer has a sense of health or, well, as we would say, checking itself to make sure that the computer works. All right? So these are actually chips on your motherboard and you can locate them. They, they, they tend to look something like what we have on the screen here. Uh, there are some technicians who can remove them depending on, on um, whether or not you know, they are resident on the board or they are resident on the board, but the technicians tend to be able to remove them by so taking off the solder wires or the, the, the solder um, that's on the, on the underside of the motherboard. But this kind of RAM, um, or definitely RAM, in general, you don't want to move. You don't want to remove it. You don't want to have anything to do with it specifically if you are just a normal user. You need to leave it alone, let it do what it's there for. So what are the types? Well, we tend to look at four different types or they're about RAM, which is just read-only memory, which basically your manufacturer places it on the board and that's it for the RAM. And again, if you if you corrupt the RAM or something goes wrong, might as well you buy another, buy another computer. They're that expensive. And then you have the programmable type, which basically, when they are created, then something or someone can program the RAM to do what, it, what you want it to do, but that's only once. So that's programmable. Then we have erasable, which of course allows for UV light to just erase what's on the, on the RAM chip. And then we have electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. So these are the four types we pay attention to. Um, and then we are going to look at the evolution of double EEPROM, which actually is flash memory, which most of us should already know about when it comes to talking about your phones. So cache is the other one that we need to look at. And you can associate this with possibly using your internet, having files stored just in case or the most frequently used files, which simply means that you might be browsing, you might be um, using a, lot of, a particular program a lot of times, you might be using some data a lot of times. What cache does is just store this information for you and stores the information so that the CPU can go directly to cache when it needs this information. It tends to be pretty small, 64 kilobit, um, kilobytes, the maximum, which is not bad. It's, it's pretty good, depending on the machine that you're working with, of course. And then we have three levels, level one, level two, and level three, which we looked at some, in some detail last week when we looked at specifications. And your level one tends to always be on your processor. So again, your processor doesn't only contain control units and ALU. There are other things inside your processor, and cache is one of them. And then you have level two, and level three. Level three is always outside your processor. And what happens with your, with your data is that when level three gets the information, then there might be other data that, you, that is frequently used, even more than what is in level three. And then there might be other things that are used more frequently than, in, than level two. And so that kind of a succession happens with your, your cache. And each one tends to be smaller than the other. So level three might be large or will be larger than your level two. Your level two will be larger in capacity than your level one. And the levels tend to, of course, well, if you look at the levels inside of your computer, it tends to dictate the type of computer you're working with. If you're working with a computer that, as we looked at last week, is about you being a gamer, or possibly you're an engineer, or possibly um, you're, you're you design, um, you design movies or you, you, you work on movies, you, you, you're an editor, something of that sort where you have a lot of information you need to work with. You'll find that your computers tend to have up to level three. And then we have our registers. Now, it's kind of technical to think about registers, uh, but what you really need to pay attention to is to the fact that they are pretty small and they might store just one little piece of data. 
but there are several registers inside your CPU. And these registered registers will basically store some very small or some very minute details or some very, very small things about an instruction. So here we are seeing that we have, well, there are three of them mentioned by name, and then there are some other general purpose ones. But we have one specific one here called a program counter. And that program counter keeps, keeps a a tab on what particular section of your program you're at or a particular line of your program. And then the instruction register um, stores the actual instruction. And then we have these general purpose registers which basically might store an integer or store, store configurations for a word or store configurations for a letter or things like that. To, to give you a better understanding, let's assume that we're working with a Pascal program. And in this Pascal program, we have A equal two plus three. Well, inside of that Pascal program, um, after we compile it, the compiler will add some information to it. And that addition is basically assembly or other subroutines that is needed to run the program. When that happens, you might have a situation where the number two is moved to a register. Then the number three is moved to another register. And then an addition takes place between both registers wherein the total is placed in the first register. So what will happen with your register? Your program counter might keep track of the lines. So for each instruction, your program counter is saying, okay, all right, we're at this line. This is what is being worked on. As soon as another instruction is ready and your CPU or your control unit has fetched it, moves on to this particular register, um, this particular line. And then, of course, these EAXs that we're seeing on EBX are actually specific registers with a specific name. And those will store the actual information. Just as we're seeing here, we're seeing two is being moved to another register and three is being moved to another register. So what's happening there? Inside of your CPU, these values are being switched in and switched out as a program is executed. And a pro don't think of a program just like Pascal. It can be software. Um, you might be running Internet Explorer. You might be running cal Calc or the calculator. You might be running Excel. All of these different um, software are running programs in the background. Uh, you might, if you look at um, your task manager, you will see processes running on your computer and each of these processes gets space in RAM and of course gets CPU time. And yes, everything relating to those instructions are stored inside registers at some point in time. And then we have what are called secondary storage devices and media. Now these store information permanently. And again, remember we said that permanently means as long as it is stored there, whether power is on or not, it is still stored on the media or on the device. Now, there are sometimes we, we, we use the word device and media interchangeably because of how the, 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 the contraption works. Here's the thing. Most of the times when we talk about media, we are talking about the particular thing that the data is stored on. So if it's a DVD, that's the media. If it's an actual platter or disk, that's media. The drive itself is the housing or the mechanism into which you place the DVD or the disk itself for the reading and writing to take place. So there is a slight distinction or, well, that's not slight, it's a, it's a big distinction, but try not to use them interchangeably, all right? But let's take a moment just to look at the smaller units of storage just before we go into these devices. We already, or we should already know what a bit is. And the bit, the word, well, the word bit is short for binary digit, all right? That's where it comes from. And that binary digit is either a zero or one. And we, we understand it as a zero or one. The fact is, your computer doesn't even know what a zero or one is. What it knows is, electricity and so your computer functions in a way that it sends pulses or weak pulses to your different devices in a series of configurations thus representing bits 
inside your machine. So if you press a key on your keyboard, a switch is inside your keyboard that fires a signal. And that signal goes to what is called, well, it should be an encoder. And that encoder takes the information and says, okay, this is, what, this is it? Okay, um, since this is what he pressed, let's send this kind of a signal to your CPU saying that this is what has been pressed. All right? So that's where your zeros and one comes from. Then we have your byte. And your byte is actually eight, digit, eight digits, all right? Uh, zero, one, zero, one, any, any number of configurations. Now, for those of you who are interested, you can check out your ASCII codes. And these ASCII codes are basically codes that tell you what the encoding for each letter, each special character is on your computer. All right? Of course, there are also zeros and ones. And then there is a smaller... Smaller measurement, a very old measurement, we call it a nibble, where you use just four, four bits um, out of the entire byte. Uh, you might have heard of the term hexadecimal, and hexadecimals basically use four digits or four binary digits to code numbers. You'll also hear the term hexadecimal when you're working with internet, when you're trying to change colors, possibly in the background of your, of your web page. So you'll find those things around. And it, it normally is stored using four binary digits. Now, you should now be acquainted with these bigger figures. Kilobytes, two to the 10 bytes, which is actually 1024 or 1024. Normally, you'll use approximations at school, but I don't expect you to do that. And I'll show you why a little bit later. So your kilobytes, two to the 10, your megabytes, two to the 20, Gigabytes, 2 to the 30. Terabytes, 2 to the 40. And of course, I could possibly say the values. And then, but there are measurements beyond um, <laughs> terabytes, 2 to the 50. I'm going to try to, to call some of these. Um, so kilobytes is 1,024. Megabytes, 1,048,576 bytes. Now, and you, you might be seeing why I'm saying don't use approximations, because you'll be leaving off all this large amount of storage space when you think about it, especially if you're going to do calculations. Gigabytes, 1,073,741,824 bytes. So if you use an approximation, again, you're leaving half 73, 73 million bytes, which you don't want to. Then we have terabytes, which is, I think it's 1 trillion, 99 billion, 511 million, 627, 776 bytes, terabytes, which we said was 1 trillion, 99 billion, 511 million, 627,776 bytes. And the measurement thereafter is petabytes. And of course, it goes beyond petabytes. And um, I might try to pronounce this, uh, 1 quadrillion, 125 trillion, 899 billion, 906 million, 842,624 bytes. Um, again, as you can see, if we use approximations, we are leaving off quite a substantial amount of storage area. And again, if you're using, if you're working with calculations, you want to keep those approximations out of your calculations. And that's why I, I adjure you, I ask you, use the thirds or the indices, 2 to the 10, 2 to the 20, etc. Because what will happen, let's say, for instance, we have, you know, a couple megabytes or just one megabyte. All right, it looks like that. But when we do the approximations, we have 48,000 576 bytes that we are disregarding. All right, and that can be, that could be a, a, a quite a bit of a, a, a pictures or, or even a more close to a small video. All right, so where do we store all this information? Well, there are two places your syllabus points out, uh, and the the second one is pretty new, I should say, but of course we've been using it for quite some time. The first one, however, is your local storage, and that means the actual device has a storage mechanism on it. Your phones, 
uh, your hard disks in your, in your um, laptops or, or in your computers, these are local storage areas. Why? Because they are present with you on the device or they're on the device. All right. And you tend to get access to these directly or indirectly, uh, directly by using some file manager. Uh, in the case of Windows, you might be using Windows um, Explorer, not Internet Explorer, no, two different, two different pieces of software. And on Mac, you might be using um, Finder. On your phone, you might just see a little folder on your phone screen that represents the file manager. And those are the tools that you use to go to these different places on your local device or your local storage. And then we have cloud. Now your cloud storage, we call it cloud simply because it's stored somewhere else. But the fact of the matter is, wherever it is stored on the internet, it's always on some machine or on some computer somewhere. So it's local there, but you just don't have that device with you currently. And so wherever you have that information on the web, it's stored on somebody else's server. And you'll access these just like how you might log in to Google or log into your email address or something like that. So you're given what is called an application programming interface. Or just somewhere where you can type in your, your email address as username or some username and a password. And when you go into that particular um, setting or that particular piece of software on their server, you are able now to access your files, your folders, you can create files and folders on, on the server, all right? So these are basically what your syllabus speaks about. And of course, there are differences between them, and they, they are wide and varied, um, but let's see if we can run through, through them as quickly as possible. Uh, the capacities for both tend to vary. And again, capacities boil down to money. Uh, if you are searching, well, if you search Amazon or any one of those, you'll find that you know, there are different storage devices or storage media, in the case of local storage. Um, and you might be paying like a, a hundred dollars or more depending on brand or depending on um, the, the capacity. And yes, it is, it does cost a pretty bit when, when you go, um, when you want a lot to store. All right. Um, however, on your cloud, it depends as well. Google, for example, and there's another one that we look at. Will, you'll basically have to pay for the storage, but you are given some amount of storage free. It was just, I think it was last week, there was somebody asking me, you know, I need to back up my files and I need to, to do them online. I'm saying, well, yeah, you can do them online and if you can pay for it, that's, that's great. And they're saying, no, I don't want to pay for it. And I'm like, okay, all right, fine. If you don't want to pay for it, create 20 Google accounts. I'm not saying that you should try that, but if you create 20 Google accounts, you get 15 gigs, that's about 300 gigs of storage. So if you want to do something like that, that's up to you. Um, don't try it and don't tell anybody that I told you to do it anyway. All right? So you can pay for this storage as is necessary. And then accessibility, as long as you have power on the particular machine or particular local machine, you can always get your... your information and but for your cloud you need power as well as internet access so there is where an, an additional cost may come into it all right the fact that you need to pay for internet access and then security issues your the cloud based storage some of them tend to guarantee some kind of security uh, or again it depends on on how you're paying for it and you have to shop around because there are so many for example with google as I said before, you get 15 giga, gigabytes free. But if you want to pay for it, there, there are about four different packages, or there might be more, um, where you pay like two cents per gigabyte. I'm not going to do any calculations where this one is concerned, though. But you pay two cents per gigabyte per month for, for that Google storage. And there is one, another one I found, um, Treasure, which gives you 10 gigabytes. And then you have a payment of about 99 or 9.99 um, or 24 dollars per month for this kind of paid storage now again when you pay for the storage they tend to guarantee security and these organizations tend to do a lot of maintenance on their machines um, they tend to always be looking for good technology can, that can work for them they are always also backing up their own or backing up your files so you can pay for these things as well uh, for cloud storage of course and it's a good way to start thinking about 
storage generally. Why? Because sometimes your devices may go down and it's important that you have some backup somewhere. I remember it was like about 10 years ago, I, I had a hard drive full of work, drawings, computer programs, all manner of things. And I had to continually just back up the things that I thought were important because I knew that someday the drive might die. But we can discuss that. So now we're talking about drives, all right? And the common one is your hard disk drive. And we're going to run to a video <laughs> just to show you what the hard disk drive looks like in motion. Um, and, but here's what. We're looking at what we call a lot of moving parts. Your disk drive spinning, that's one movement. The read-write head on the device moves. And that moves because of what is called an armature or an arm that moves the head along the disk. Now you might be saying, what on earth? Why does that look like that? Well, you might not be seeing the spinning right now because it's spinning at about 7200 revolutions per minute. Now that is pretty fast. And that kind of tells you why when you are using your computer, it is moving that quickly when you're retrieving files. If your computer isn't retrieving files quickly, then there are other things that you can do. You can do what is called a disk defragmentation. Um, you can try to organize your files so that your disk will keep the same file in, different, in, in the same sectors or closed sectors, all right? And that will help you to retrieve the information much quickly. And as you can see from the video, this person is basically moving the read-write head. Now, if you can do that, you're not supposed to be touching anything in your drive like that. Uh, but it does show you that it can move. One of the problems, or very early problems with disks, was that the film of air between the disk and the read-write head was so small. And any time that read-write head touches your disk, while it's spinning at 7200 revs per minute, it basically scratches the surface of your disk. And that is what we call a head crash, all right? So we have your hard disk. And basically, it's a magnetic medium. So your read-write head acts as a magnet and magnetizes the material or magnetizes the disk in a certain kind of a way that allows for the storage of, of bytes or bits. And we, we talk about, a, um, IBM, I should say, was talking about a proposed um, increase in density, which means that it makes everything store a little bit closer and compact on your hard disk and thus increases storage capacity. The access time uh, for your hard disk tend to range from about five to eight milliseconds. And that access time is measured by the time it takes for you to move your arm or move the, the arm of the, of the read-write head. And of course, because they have moving parts, they may fail. Uh, well, thank God, though, for the past couple of years, um, IBM has only reported 2 to 9% failure per year, which is pretty good considering the fact that there are so many hard drives all over the world. But this failure rate is something for you to keep in mind because it helps you now to think, okay, what if the disk fails? What am I going to now do? The idea, look to the cloud or look, look for some other storage media, which could mean that you go for something external and you just store, it, store needed things on an external drive. Another look at it, if we break down your hard disk, we see where your hard disk has what we call sectors, tracks, and cylinders. And these basic sections of your hard disk are used just to help the computer understand locations on your hard disk. So let's say, for instance, you want to retrieve something from your hard disk. Your OS will tell you, okay, go to this particular cylinder, this particular platter, or this particular disk, and this particular sector. And your operating system and your CPU have to be negotiating all of that going forward in order to retrieve things for you. Um, there, I, I spoke about defragmentation earlier. Um, one of the things that tends to happen with your disk is that while it is spinning, while it is spinning, your computer is storing fragments of your file 
all over your disk. So it's not storing everything in one track. It's fragmented all over. And so it might store some information in one sector, move to another place and store it in another sector. And so your computer has to keep track of where all these fragments are. And that's why I would say you need to defrag your computer. All right? Um, so we said earlier that the, the, the disk is spinning at about 7,200 revs per minute. And that is quite important given the fact that you have to pay attention to how much information needs retrieving and how fast you need the retrieval. So as your disk rotates, the amount of times that one particular point on your disk goes under the head is about 7,200 times in one minute. So can you imagine every, that being accessed 7,200 times? That's pretty fast. All right? And there are some devices, of course, or the majority of them that have multiple disks, or we call them multiple platters, have read-write heads for each platter. All right? So for each disk, there's a read-write head. And in many cases, there are two read-write heads, one for the top of the disk, one for the underside of the disk. And so that is where we talk about double density or, or even um, double-sided. So your read writer is able now to take information not only from the top but from the bottom as well. And then we have another look at it from the breakdown as it relates to sectors and track sector. Now each sector in your device or on your, your disk stores about 512 bytes, right, each one. And that is why we talk about fragmentation. If you're storing a file that's about you know, 100 kilobytes, we have to break it down, or your computer has to break it down into 512 bytes to put it in different sectors on your hard disk. And so each block of space, each sector, stores about 512 bytes, all right? So keep that in mind as well. And again, your read-write head has to move along your disk, track by track, in order to read from these different sectors. Then we have what are called SSD drives, which in my mind are possibly some of the, the better drives. Uh, for, for the same reason in that because they have no moving parts, then they, they have a longer longevity or a longer life. Um, so they are basically what makes up what we know as flash memory. And you can think about it as just a number of clusters of storage um, storage devices are semiconductors. Those of you who might do chemistry or physics might know what a semiconductor is. Um, and, and normally semiconductors are created, well, uh, all right, let me just go in there for the sake of going into it. Semiconductors are created with silicon, basically. And you've heard, you should have heard the term Silicon Valley. Why? Because in that valley, there is a, a quite a bit of silicon. And what silicon is, it's a particular element from element that is found naturally in sand etc and it can store charge as well as um, take away charge from it so it it can stay in different states and be stable and so that is what you need you can remember about it all right now your ssds are pretty portable they're pretty small and the reason why they're small of course because there are no spinning disc and arms in them but just pure electronics all right and so you can carry them around with you. Uh, but be careful with that. As you carry them around, you want to ensure that whatever you're carrying around, you don't bring a lot of static charge to it or you don't expose it to, un, um, to electricity un, unnecessarily. All right? So may, make note of that. And then we have access times, which are about one millisecond. So you can see immediately there's about a seven millisecond difference, but that's a big difference given the fact that this is just one millisecond because all you have to do when you plug it in, basically the information that you want to store or you want to retrieve just takes one second to find where it is and get it back as opposed to the access arm or the, the arm of your hard disk moving in and out. All right. So flash memory. Flash memory. The same thing we're talking about when we're talking about SSDs, but the technology behind it comes from EEPROM, and that's what we were talking about earlier. EEPROM has evolved, or the evolution of it brought about flash memory. And so with EEPROM, even though you, can, you are changing small amounts, and that's the difference with EEPROM and flash, you, you can change small amounts on EEPROM, but with your flash memory, you can change quite considerable amount of data and so that was used now for phones and of course it is resident on the board 
So we have more irreversible data um, and the technology behind it's technology behind flash drives and memory cards. All right. So you might maybe one of the days you, you try to experiment and, and you opened your flash drive and you might have seen a little chip in your flash drive. All right. That is flash memory. Um, and of course, some of you might, when you pull it, you know that it still works. So that's some experiment for you to try. And then you have memory cards, which need different memory card readers, but it's the same kind of technology, basically. And then we have our optical disks. Uh, these are getting <laughs> more or less obsolete. Well, unless you have like Blu-ray for, uh, for your movies, etc. But your optical drives employ the use of light and lasers for the sole purpose of reading and writing. And it depends on the type of device you have or you know, burner that you might have. You'll be able to write information to the device. All right? So what are they? Well, we know CDs and DVDs, and I tend to group them simply because you know, of their usage, most of them not. We have CD-ROMs, CD-R's, CD-plus-R's, and CD rewritable, and each of them having their own use, and <clears throat> we'll just explore them shortly. Minus R, in terms of CD minus R, means that when you add information to this particular CD or DVD, you won't be able to add any more information on it. So even if the information has not filled the, the, the media to capacity, you won't be able to add anything. And you might be burning things and you'll see where your, your burner or your software tells you that, you know, should you close the media, right? CDRs tend to be like that. As soon as you've burned something, that's it. Your plus Rs means that you can add data onto whatever you've added until you've reached capacity. And simply your rewrite will mean that you can erase whatever is on it and, of course, put something else on your, on your, your media. However, each of these, or the, even this rewritable, has a certain lifespan. So you might be able to write or rewrite, you know, possibly 20 times or thereabout. But after that, basically, it's, it's done for. And then we have our Blu-ray discs, which have been com become commonplace for, for movies since of late. And there are, we have three different types, according to verbatim. Recordable, just like, which is just like the R from your CDs or your DVDs, and then recordable dual layer. So we'll look at that a little bit more. And then rewritable RE for your Blu-rays. Same kind of mechanism as your rewritable for CDs and DVDs. So let's look at the mechanism just a bit or what's inside the disc. Your disc contains um, certain layers of material. Some of them are reflective or most of them are reflective. Now, as you can, as, or as you might can see, that there's 1.2 millimeters. Your disc, your disc is pretty small. So for someone or for even a device to have different layers, can the technology is pretty remarkable. And so we're looking at it that if you have a dual layer, there's a silver layer of aluminum. In a dual layer, you might have several of these layers upon which information is burnt or stored, and. In your DVDs and your CDs and your Blu-rays, there are basically what we call pits and lands. So these pits and lands reflect light in different manner. And here's what happens. As your light moves across the surface of your disc, what is happening is that if there's a change in the reflection that stipulates that, okay, that is where we, we record a one. If there isn't a change over time, then it's pure zero. But as long as there's a change, then it's a one. So if you're, if you're going across the disk and meet up on a pit, that edge that between the pit and the land is referred to as a one. All right? Um, so we have several layers of coating um, always. And then, of course, the measurement of the beam is what determines um, the change. All right? All right. So let's look at them um, with a little bit more, uh, what can I say, <laughs> a closer, a, a bigger microscope. Uh, your CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs tend to be different in terms of the size of pits and lands, the size or the, the distance between the track itself, and of course, the 
how clustered each pit and land is basically to each other. So the, the, the measurements tend to be smaller as you progress. So with your CDs, you have a certain measurement for your pit or your land. All right. So your, your laser burns on these devices in that manner. But then for your DVDs, these pits and lands get remarkably smaller than your CD. And if you have a dual layer DVD, what that means is that those very same measurements for your pits and lands are reflected on both layers or the different layers that exist there. And then Blu-ray, of course, it was given its name because the laser was blue, <laughs> but it's a very high intense laser, which ensures, and, and very precise, that ensures that your laser burns the aluminum film or whatever it's being stored on and very minuscule, all right? Very small, very tight, very compact. And uh, that, of course, accounts for the different sizes. For your CD, you go up to about 700 megs. Your DVD, depending on the layer, the, the regular ones are, well, it depends on the layer. Sometimes you have dual layers, etc. You will have about 4.7 to about 8.5 gigabytes of storage. And your HD DVD 15, and then your Blu-ray is like the monster of them all, up to 128 gigabytes, all right? So can you imagine? Um, some computers didn't even have that much storage at one point. But all this storage now allows them to, of course, use it for different types of things. So let me quickly show you an application where that is concerned. If we have a movie of about two hours long, and you know, well, feature movies are about two hours long. For those of you who watch, uh, um, what was it? Avengers Endgame is about three hours. Um, so what we do now is to identify how many seconds are in that movie, which is about 7,200. And then each second has a number of frames. Most of them are 24 frames, which is like 24 pictures. There are other movies that are shot at like 60 frames per second, but, you know, that's a whole heap. And then that will tell us how many frames are in the entire movie. When you find out those frames, if it's a picture, the picture might be about 0.5 megabytes. And when we are finished with that, you can see where our movie might be about 84 gigs in size. But again, we need to make sure that we change other things so that we can compress it and that it can store on the DVDs or on the Blu-ray. That's it for today.